Police officers and state troopers across Connecticut rallied in protest trying to stop lawmakers from passing that accountability legislation. Joining us on Face the State is Bernie Hallams, a veteran officer with the Manchester Police Department who recently retired. Thank you for joining us on Face the State. Thank you so much, Susan. Talk to me about uh, your career as a police officer and what you see happening now uh, on the force after this bill passed. Um, you know, I was fortunate to work in an amazing town with an amazing community. Um, we focused a lot on community policing, which is some of the uh, things that they're trying to bring up to speed with other agencies. And, you know, it works very well. And now with this new accountability bill, it's very scary f area for law enforcement officers and um, what's going to take place in next year when this bill is enacted. They're afraid. They're not really sure what's going to take place because there's so many articles and it's so vague. But if the standards, according to Representative Steve Staffstrom, uh, that it has to be under the most egregious cases, that it has to be willful, wanton misconduct, violating, violating somebody's constitutional rights. So if it has to be, or it is that, then what are people afraid of? I think they're afraid of the fact that the bill itself is very vague. It doesn't spell that out. It, you know, it was hastily put together. Um, and police officers aren't afraid of legislation, but there was no part for officers to be involved in the process of change. There was no research. There was no time taking for to get this legislation forward. It was less than three months from the time it was presented before it was signed off, I believe, by the governor, which is not a lot of time to research anything, especially something so big. And it's going to have such an effect on law enforcement officers and the way that they do their job. That's a concern that we've heard from several police officers, that something of this magnitude that affects uh, so many law enforcement across the state, uh, that why do this in a special session? Why not hear from all parties and craft out something uh, with a little more time? Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, we had some very bad incidences in America involving law enforcement, uh, agreeable. And law enforcement officers, good officers, to cry that along with the public. But when everyone's upset, it's very easy to pass something like this to force change because people haven't calmed down to really look at the reality of the situation and to try to understand the difficulties of law enforcement officers have every day going out there on the streets and working. I can't, you know, I, to say this is a black-white issue, I don't think anything uh, is a black-white issue, but with uh, officers of color on the force, do you think that they see things, do you see things differently, uh, perhaps, and are you caught in a situation where you're a law enforcement officer, but you're also an African-American who's watching people across our country uh, be abused and killed? It, it is, you know, honestly, Susan, it is. It, it can be very conflicting because, yes, um, you can get vilified because you're a law enforcement officer, but at the end of the day, and I'm proud to be an African-American male. And um, what I think the problem is, if we look at this country and say we take out the 900,000 police officers and that's racism, that's terrible. I mean, this country has a racism problem that extends way beyond its police departments. And the police departments are there to prevent these things from becoming larger. Right. And we had talked about, uh, you know, the some or the perception that this was rushed through or not enough time, but it's not going to be in effect tomorrow. In fact, there's a year or two deadline of working through it. So are you hopeful uh, that through that process that police can get uh, the training that they need and perhaps any kind of concerns uh, that they have addressed? Absolutely. I mean, um, you know, we do training now with officers and we've done it before. And one thing that officers are never going to argue with is more training. Anything that develops their skill set to be better than they already are, they're going to take advantage of it. And they always do. When you put out these classes before these things occurred, those classes are always filled because officers always want to know how to be better. Not proficient with their firearms, proficient with their mouths and their skill set, how to talk to people and how to bridge those gaps with communities where maybe police aren't favorable and presence is so important. And our officers go out there every day and do that. You retired last year, right? Can you share with us how you feel the relationship is with officers in your community? Is there enough community policing? And do you feel that the belief that you know police officers are not to be trusted is is growing do you worry about that 
I do worry about that. Um, here in our community, they have a strong community policing program, um, including school resource officers and other things that have been attacked by, you know, Chris Murphy and others like that, that are doing really well and have been well. See, they're not reacting to what's going on. These programs were already in place. So they've been staples in this community for many, many years. And it's, it's very sickening to me to see what officers are going through nowadays. And you're looking at, and you know, I do training with some officers, and you see that officers are frustrated. And you're seeing a lot of officers that are at the end, towards the end of their career, getting ready to leave because of this stuff. Retention is becoming very difficult because officers are like, we're afraid of the unknown. You know, and they love their communities and they don't want to leave their communities, but they feel something like this bill will force them out of their jobs. We need police, probably more now than ever. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, to, we sure do. We want to thank you, Bernie Hallams, for joining us on Face the State this morning. Thank you so much, Susan. Connecticut has medicinal marijuana, but it's not legal for recreational use. Eleven states, however, do allow pot to be sold, but the debate here continues. A new Yukon study takes a look at how money and Connecticut's economy could benefit. That's up next.